our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, would you lasso our hearts this morning with the word of your truth that our thoughts might be on a short leash to your thoughts, that our thoughts would be taken captive by your worldview, by your view of us, by your view of sin, by your view of grace and mercy. Left to ourselves, O oh God, our thoughts run astray, they run amok. How desperately we need you. Would you be present here by the power of your Holy Spirit to change us, to bring our minds and hearts and thoughts into conformity with your own? We ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we're making our way through the book of Romans, we find ourselves in Romans chapter 9 a text of scripture that is difficult for the natural mind, difficult for a man-centered way of thinking about things. And it tends to rub us the wrong way. And yet it is so critical that we corral our thoughts. Left our own ideas, left our own logic, we will not arrive at the way God knows the world to be. And yet it is so critical that we must arrive there. We're going to read through Romans 9. Our passage this morning is 19 through 24. We're going to start back in verse 17 and pick up where we left off last time with the illustration of Pharaoh. Here's what Paul writes. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, God has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay? to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use. And if God, because he is willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared for beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. Where we left off last week was the life and times of Pharaoh, ruler of Egypt. And we discovered in Romans 9 that God hardens and pardons. He hardens some in their sin and rebellion against him, and he pardons others by his mercy and his grace. And God's gracious selection of those whom he will save is not based on the merits of any who get saved but only on the kind intention of God's will in love. So the question that comes up in our continuing uh, walk through Romans 9 is, is God fair in doing so? And we've seen in the last couple of weeks that, yes, God always acts in keeping with his character, in keeping with his purposes, in keeping with his justice and righteousness. And you and I ought not ask questions about fairness. If we want fairness, we will only be punished for our sins. We need not fairness from God, but mercy from God. And yet Paul here is putting in something of an objector, as someone who is arguing against his own dialogue about God. He's inserting someone who disagrees with Paul. It's an interesting way to draw out in Paul's readers and to draw out in us thoughts that might be lurking there, that raise their objections over and against God's dealings with humanity. And you might find yourself in this objector. You might find yourself in these questions. No doubt from time to time, you've wondered, well, if Pharaoh is only doing what God planned for him to do, why does Pharaoh get punished for it? And there's no mistaking the history. 
Pharaoh did exactly what God intended for Pharaoh to do. And Pharaoh was judged and buried by the Red Sea for it. There's no getting away from the history of it. Uh, The question that's on the table here for us this morning is the rightness of it posed by this objector that Paul puts forward. We, We have on a collision course here the inexorable purposes of God and the sinful choices of man. Is it right for God to punish sinners when by their sinful actions, God is accomplishing his glorious, perfect, right, just, and good purposes? If God gets the good and the glory and he uses sinners to accomplish it, why then does he punish sin? That is the question Paul poses here. You will say to me, verse 19, why does he still find fault for who resists his will? We need to understand that Pharaoh's case is not an isolated case. If we go back to Habakkuk chapter 1, Uh, You can read it this afternoon. In Habakkuk 1, you have the the case of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. And God is going to use the Babylonians to discipline his people Israel. And the Babylonians have no interest in the glory of God nor the godliness of his people. They have an interest in destruction. They wipe out everything in their paths. And God is going to use their bent-on-destruction army to accomplish his good purposes in his people. And then God will turn around and punish the Babylonians for it. Something similar is done in Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah details for us the Assyrians. The Assyrians likewise are bent on destruction of empires, building their own empire by murder and piracy on an empire scale. And God is going to use Assyria to accomplish his purposes amongst his people Israel. And then he's going to turn around and punish the Assyrians for sinning in it. Now, there's nothing new here between Pharaoh and the Chaldeans and the Assyrians. You can read about Ahab's death in 1 Kings 22. Where a disobedient soldier takes an arrow and slings it up into the air. And that arrow fulfills God's purpose and takes Ahab out through a chink in the armor. And according to God's perfect purpose... Ahab didn't die there. He told his chariot driver, take me out of the battle. And Ahab went and died on the spot that God predicted he would die. A rogue arrow and a rogue king doing what they wanted to do and yet accomplishing God's purposes and plans and held accountable for their sin. Scott Demarest this morning read about the betrayal of Judas Jesus said of him, this stumbling block must come, but woe, woe to that man. It'd be better that he had not been born. (laughs) Judas does what Judas wants to do. And it is exactly in line with accomplishing God's purposes. And Judas is called the son of perdition. And of course, the cross itself This man whom you crucified, Peter says to the Jews. By the predetermined plan of God, Jesus went to the cross. And his murderers are held accountable. And God's purposes are accomplished. Think about Satan. The arch enemy of God with murderous intent against humanity. Murderous intent against the seed of the woman. Murderous intent against the nation which God set out for himself genocidal murder on a national scale trying to wipe out Israel and then with murderous intent against Jesus at every turn. Satan eventually got what he wanted, the death of Jesus. (laughs) And yet it is exactly by the death of Jesus Christ that God undoes the curse, defeats death, and is the first death blow against Satan himself. Satan is a defeated enemy, still allowed to roam around, prowl about the earth. But the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, believer, because of what Christ has done. The very thing that Satan set out to do, kill Jesus. God is up to his own purposes in the sins of humanity. And each sinner operates within his own abilities, within his own inclinations, within his own desires. Sorry, Tommy. 
my fault. Here we go again. <coughs> I really don't have a sore throat. It doesn't feel sore. This time, I'm a little more prepared. <clears throat> Is a vegan free to eat a double-double? How's that for getting us back on track? <laughs> No one's holding a gun to a vegan's head saying, you are not allowed to go to In-N-Out Burger. But he's not free to eat a double-double. That violates his own inclinations, his own desires, perhaps his own convictions. When, when a sinner's operations, according to their own inclinations, desire, and will, are culpable, is it wrong for God to punish if a sinner is free within his own abilities, his own power, his own inclinations to do whatever he wants to do, but all of those activities are in fact sinful, is it wrong for God to punish sin? That's the question on the table. And when God employs those operations, those sinful operations, to accomplish glorious and good ends, is God to be blamed? And is the sinful operator off the hook? First of all, the fact that God can and does employ moral agents with wills, desires, affections, with minds, if he can employ them uncoerced to accomplish his purposes, it only demonstrates the vast difference between God's power and our power. It's not an endorsement of their behavior. It's a demonstration of his power. You see, I can't get moral agents to accomplish my purposes. I don't know if you've tried that. I can't even make non-moral agents, like the cat, to accomplish my purposes. Often I can't even get inanimate, inanimate objects to obey me. The fact that God can and does get his perfect will done by means of sinful, rebellious, moral agents with minds, with thoughts, with affections, with wills, only proves that his ways are higher than ours. Our inability to understand this does not negate its truth. By the way, if you want truth you can totally get your head around, then that truth will be smaller than you and not worthy of worship. There's a second reality that God holds people accountable for their sin as they are used by him to accomplish his purposes. Verse 19 begins with a therefore. Therefore, you will say to me. It's seen as a then in the New American Standard. It's an inference. It's, it's building up on what Paul has said before. And, and Paul is projecting a typical man-centered response to God's dealings with Pharaoh. Pharaoh sinned, but in his sin, he's, he was accomplishing the redemption of Israel. So why would God, God find fault with him? But notice the implications of God's dealings with Pharaoh reach way beyond Pharaoh. Otherwise, we really wouldn't be worried about it. We wouldn't be talking about it today if it was only about Pharaoh. As if Paul's objector in this uh, passage was somehow filled with a heart of compassion for that poor king long ago. He doesn't really care about Pharaoh. What does the objector care about? He, he cares about himself. Um, when he's saying, why does God still find fault, what he's really saying is, I want to continue my godless trajectory and I don't want God to hold me accountable. And maybe the way I can get away from holding God accountable is to point my finger at God and threaten him with criminal behavior if he holds me accountable for my sin while I go my godless direction. As if the force of that argument was something God had never thought of, and when he hears you say it, he's like, oh, my bad, I'll let you off the hook. This is, in fact, something that God has thought of. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And so this passage serves for us, through this objector, through the Apostle Paul, as something of a warning. Why does God still find fault with Pharaoh? And, and you and I sitting here might say, well, because there is fault to find. <laughs> and that's true. It's not wrong for God to find fault when there is, in fact, fault to find. But who resists his will, replies the objector. And the answer to that is no one. No one does. That was clear in Pharaoh's case. 
But then doesn't that make somebody a robot? And that's the way our minds work. We think the only way that God can get his will done is if he makes us without a will, without inclinations, without desires, or, or without some ability to do things within our sphere of ability or desires. And that's not the case. We might need to operate that way. You have a remote control car. That remote control car is only going to go where you tell it to go. Um, it can only accomplish what it does based on its own mechanisms. But a human being is not a remote control car. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 20 and see an example that really is the truth behind all of God's dealings with humanity. Theologians would call this compatibilism. That is the idea of the sovereignty of God, the absolute sovereignty of God is compatible with the idea of moral agency. That is, human beings do what they want to do, and God gets his will done every single time. And Genesis 20 is something of a behind-the-scenes look at that reality that happens all the time. This is the story of Abraham, his wife Sarah, and Abimelech the king. Abraham's wife Sarah is beautiful. He's convinced that if he walks into a new kingdom, the kingdom will take the most beautiful woman for himself, Abram's wife, and steal her from him and kill Abraham to get her. And, and he may or may not have been wrong in that, except that God's already made promises to Abraham. He should have trusted. He didn't trust. He lies to Abimelech. Verse 3 of Genesis 20, God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you're a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. Now Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a nation even though blameless? Did he not say himself to me, she's my sister? And she herself said, he's my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. That is, Abimelech says, listen, I didn't go near her. I did everything above board. What does God say? God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart, you have done this. And I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Do you understand the compatibilism here? Abimelech did exactly what he thought was right according to his own desires. He didn't feel like a robot. And God was superintending every single event, even over the inclinations that he had. And that is the truth behind all of God's dealings with humanity. Nothing new in that. And if it is God's will to employ sinners to sinfully accomplish his purposes and then punish them for their sin, who is going to argue with God. By the way, God's not punishing Pharaoh for setting Israel free. Do we understand that? Oh, Pharaoh, you did it. Uh, you hardened your heart. Uh, you wouldn't let him go so that I can magnify my signs among you so the whole world will know that I'm powerful and I hate sin and I'm interested in rescuing my people. Um, and you faithfully obeyed me. You were longing for my glory to be put on display. You were eager for Israel to be set free from captivity and slavery. And so you complied. I'm punishing you for that. That's not what happened. Pharaoh did what Pharaoh wanted, and God got what God wanted. And Pharaoh's accountable for his sins. Paul does not deny that God is sovereign, nor that man is responsible. But Paul is demonstrating the rebellion involved in complaining about it. Notice the nature of this question in verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who resists his will? These are logical deductions built out of complaint against God's sovereignty and holiness. These are not affirmations of God's glory, his sovereignty and his love of holiness and saying, God, I'm really interested in your ways. Will you show me how you do your business? It's not a heart of faith that's making this objection. This is not a humble, reverent, interested in my master's business type of question. This is a rebellious, challenging, threatening accusation designed to get me, the sinner, off the hook. It makes God out to be a criminal for doing what is right. And this from the lips of one who has never known anything but criminality against God. It's the height of irony and it's audacious and bold and irreverent and cringeworthy. And so the answer comes in four parts. And the rest of the section we're looking at this morning, verses 20 to 24. 
The first answer to the question is simply a question. Who do you think you are? Is effectively what Paul says. On the contrary, who are you, O man, that answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? It begins with this on the contrary, an emphatic rebuttal, a strong correction to wrong thinking. And he says, O man. This is a highly charged emotional interjection. It happens a couple other times in Scripture. And it's used in situations of highly charged emotion. And then the, the pronoun in the original is fronted all the way at the beginning of the sentence in kind of an unusual way that puts the emphasis on you. You, O oh man, who do you think you are? It's emphatic. And then this idea of answering back, arguing back, back talk to God. And to God here is an emphatic contrast to O oh man. And it introduces us to this infinite chasm, the distinction between the creator and the creature. And that distinction is illustrated for us in the second half of verse 20. The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Have your blueberry pancakes ever talked back? They don't do that. Yes? <laughs> Somebody says yes. I want to see those pancakes. You're playing with Play-Doh. And you make a giraffe, and the giraffe talks back. Well, that has two problems. Giraffes in real life don't have vocal cords. They can't talk. They don't make any noise. And a Play-Doh giraffe certainly doesn't talk back to you. We understand the, the silliness of this illustration, and Paul is picking up on probably two passages, kind of combining them from Isaiah, Isaiah 29, 16. You turn things around says God through Isaiah, shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? Do you hear the implication? If the clay is talking back to the potter, the clay is elevating itself to a level of equality that's inappropriate. That what is made would say to its maker, he didn't make me, or that what is formed, say to him who formed it, he has no understanding. Isaiah 45, 9 probably lends its voice to this text as well. Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker. An earthenware vessel among the vessels of the earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands. Of course not. The problem with the, the, this response, this talk back to God, is it assumes the same level and it impugns God as criminal in his activities. And so the first answer to the question is, you have no business asking this question. Well, why did Paul ask it? Good question. I'll answer that question with a question. Is it possible that Paul got this question a lot in his evangelism? I think it's highly likely. Is it possible that Paul got this question from Christians who got this question in their evangelism? That's probably likely too. And so he asks it and answers it for us. Second answer to the question, is it fair for God to punish sinners when their sinful actions accomplish his purposes? Second answer is this, God as creator has authority over his creation. This is verse 21. By simple right of creation, God has authority to do what he pleases with what he makes. That's true of you and the blueberry pancakes, is true of you and the Play-Doh giraffe. But notice what Paul says. Does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? You go back to ancient Near Eastern pottery making, and there is a lump of clay, one lump of clay, and the potter gets to decide what he makes out of that one lump of clay. And and one batch of that clay might serve a very noble purpose, and one batch of that clay might serve a very ignoble purpose. And who gets to decide? The clay? God gets to decide. In the clay and the potter illustration, the potter decides. And notice the single source from the same lump. And, and that phrase, the same lump, is emphatic. It's emphatic in its position. It's emphatic in the way it's stated in the original there is one lump of clay, and let me ask you this. What kind of clay is available for God to work with? 
when we're talking about human beings. The, the, the lump of humanity that we are all born a part of. And it's difficult clay. We are, by nature, difficult to work with from birth. And so God asserts his right as creator over his created things. I won't read this here this morning, but Jeremiah 18, 1 to 12, deals at length with this picture of the potter and the clay and God's ability to do what he pleases with those The third answer to the question, is it fair for God to punish sinners when their sinful actions accomplish their purposes? The third answer comes in verse 22. If God wants to put his attributes on display through judgment, if God wants to put his attributes on display through judgment, dot, 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 the answer sort of trails off. I put on your outline, he can. But the he can is implied, it's not in the text. There's there's a reason that all of the English versions have a hard time making a complete sentence out of verses uh, 22 and 23. And the answer is because there's not a complete sentence. It's an if with no then. Verses 22 and 23 are an interesting structure. It's It's a conditional sentence that assumes the truth of what's asserted with no ending to it. It's incomplete. It just sort of trails off. If God wants to do this, and the implication is, he can. He's God. If God wants to put his attributes on display through judgment, he can do that. Listen, if God, willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction dot, dot, dot. It just sort of hangs there. This idea of God willing to demonstrate, the the, the willing to demonstrate has been translated a couple of different ways. Um, The New American Standard uh, that, that I'm reading this morning says this, what if God, although willing to demonstrate, Uh, that's not a helpful translation. It makes the, the idea here concessive. Uh, That means God's conceding something. Um, Even though God sort of wanted to do one thing, he did another. That's not what the original says. By the way, the the, uh, ESV, Holman Christian Standard, and the King James, if you're reading those, they get this one right. (laughs) They don't make it a concessive. They make it causal. So instead of saying, although God wants to show his wrath and power, instead he was patient. They don't say that. They say this. Because God wants to show his wrath and power, he was patient. And so if you've got the New American Standard Bible open in front of you, I would encourage you, cross out although and write because. I'm not telling you to change your Bible. I'm suggesting that it's appropriate to adjust your English translation just a little bit. And, and, and if your spouse is reading the ESV, maybe just sneak a peek over there. This is exactly the point that Paul has just made concerning Pharaoh. God did not destroy Pharaoh immediately, but after raising him to power, sustaining him through the plagues, so that his gracious, merciful, powerful rescue of Israel would be known throughout the entire world and would be remembered forever by God's people. To translate this as the New American Standard does, Uh, is to say, God wanted to be known for his wrath and power, but instead he was nice to Pharaoh. That's not the point. Wanting to be known for his wrath and power, God was patient with Pharaoh. That's the idea. And so he endured with much patience vessels of wrath. Consider what it means for God to be patient, by the way, to bear patiently the rebellions of his creatures. Have you ever thought about that? For Christ to bear patiently the unbelief, the mockery, the murderous intentions, the dull and finicky faith of his followers, the unrighteous rulers, and the mob calling for his execution. The soldiers jeering passersby at his crucifixion. Think about what it means for God to bear patiently with Satan. Why? Why? 
because God desired to demonstrate his wrath. And the form of the verb here indicates um, this is pointing back to himself. Uh, For reasons found in God, he wants to demonstrate his wrath. This is a subtle hint that this is for his own glory. And because he desired to make his power known, to publish his divine attributes before a watching world. By the way, God's anger about sin and his power are critical things that every human being needs to know. If you're not convinced that God hates sin, you'll just keep running in it to your own destruction. And if you're not convinced that God is powerful, you might think that you could overwhelm him in the end. Or if you don't think that God is powerful, you might be convinced of your sin and not sure that God's able to save. The world must know that God hates sin and that God is powerful, and so he puts these things on display. This combination, angry at sin and limitless in power, to put these on display is completely in keeping with God's character and his purpose. This is right and just for God to do this. Bearing up, exercising much patience with, notice this, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Vessels of wrath, that that is a a phrase delineating destiny. Their destiny is destruction. It's not talking about people that God is going to save, being patient with them before they repent, or patient with them as they grow. This is not about Jesus being patient with Peter. This is about Jesus being patient with Judas, with the Antichrist and the false prophet. This is God bearing patiently with people marked out for eternal destruction. And the verb prepared here means to prepare for a purpose. And just to be a little bit grammar geeky for a second, uh, it's in the perfect tense and it's a passive form. The idea is having been prepared and it is an adjectival participle. Uh, the, The way we should think about this is something like this. The vessels, what kind of vessels? The having been prepared kind of vessels. The having been prepared for destruction kind of vessels. They were prepared and they remain in the state of preparation for eternal destruction. And what's not stated is who does the preparation. This is what we call the divine passive. It's a passive verb, but the understanding is that God is doing the preparation. Now, this is consistent with the context. God is the potter, people are the clay. God makes out of the same lump vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and vessels for mercy prepared for glory. And destruction here is not annihilation. It's not a going out of existence. It is conscious eternal torment under the infinite unflinching wrath of God in hell forever. One irony in this passage is this turns the tables on unbelieving Israel. Remember, it was the nation of Israel that was rescued from Egypt under Pharaoh's tyrannical reign by God's dealings in this way. And now Israel, unbelieving Israel, is in the crosshairs of God's indictment. The the Jews in, in Paul's day would have said, yes, the exodus But the very thing that destroyed Pharaoh is the very thing in God that will destroy them in their unbelief. Pharaoh's destruction becomes an illustration of their own. A fourth answer to the question, is it fair for God to punish sinners when their sinful actions accomplish his purposes, is found in verses 23 and 24. Read there. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. The answer to the question is this in verses 23 and 24. If God wants to put his attributes on display through salvation, again, it just trails off. And the implication is he can He does. Why does God judge? For his own glory. Why does God save? For his own glory. To put his glorious attributes on display. The if statement of verse 22 continues through verse 23. 
It should read this way, and if God, willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and in order to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy. In other words, God endured with much patience vessels of wrath in order to, verse 23, make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy. What is the stated purpose of God's patiently enduring evil? And we think, I know what it is. It's to make my life more miserable. Psalm 37, Psalm 73, that's what the psalmist thought in the first halves of both of those psalms. God, why, why are the wicked prospering? It makes my life really hard. Can't you take care of them right now? And God wanted the psalmist in the second half of Psalm 37 and Psalm 73 to know something else. The depths of God's grace and mercy unfolded in his perfect purposes and his perfect timing. This is grace by contrast. It's why when you go buy an engagement ring and the jeweler puts the diamond uh, not attached to anything else on a black background under just the right lights. It sparkles against the black. It's like experiencing really good health after a prolonged sickness. You, you don't appreciate it until there's something to contrast it with. Or getting oxygen for the first time after deprivation, maybe at high altitude. I don't know if you've ever done that. You, you go up to about 10,000 feet, you have a hard time breathing, maybe you start feeling dizzy, woozy, and throwing up, and all you have to do is drive down a few thousand feet, all of a sudden you feel great. I love oxygen. I didn't know I love oxygen before. But now by contrast, I value it. Listen, let us never enjoy sin that God intends to use to magnify his attributes through the display of his anger against sin and his power to judge and to save. That which God will use for the destruction of the wicked. Let us never revel in these things. Do you understand? When I sin... And if I'm in Christ and my sins are covered by the blood of Christ, I'm engaging in things, entertaining things, loving things that people will suffer forever in hell for so that God will get his glory in the destruction of the wicked. May it never be that we would love sin. There's an interesting preposition here. The word upon that God would make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy. You see, in verse 22, God demonstrated wrath and he made power known, but no audience is stated. Everyone will see it, by the way. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of the Father. But in verse 23, Paul says that God is making his riches of glory known upon specific people. That's interesting. It's not that he's making it known to them. He's making it known upon them. The audience is specified. These are recipients of God's kindness and mercy and grace. And, and audience is not really the right word. This is not like showing up at a performance to observe, going to a play and watching the performers do their thing. But the, the riches of God's glory are showered upon vessels of mercy. There is participation and involvement, personal experience in the glory of God being dispensed. This is lavish, undeserved love by God to be appreciated and felt and in part appreciated and felt by contrast to what we deserve. Notice he says these are vessels of mercy prepared beforehand for glory. How does God prepare a vessel of mercy? I know that in English the word prepared shows up in verse 22 and 23, spelled exactly the same way. It looks the same. We might get the impression that the way God prepares a vessel of wrath and a vessel of mercy is symmetrical, and it's not. The way God prepares vessels of wrath and the way God prepares vessels of mercy for their respective destinations is very different, and it's very important. 
The differences are seen in several features. First of all, prepared in verse 22 and prepared in verse 23 are two totally unrelated and different words. They're just in different places in the dictionary. Uh, They're not related to each other. Uh, They are sort of synonyms, and so the English word prepared is used for both of them, but you need to know from the start they are different words altogether. Secondly, um, this second prepared in verse 23 is active, not passive. In verse 22, it's those who are being prepared, those who have been prepared. It's like if I say, I kicked the ball, that's active. If I say, the ball was kicked, that's passive. You see, one emphasizes the ball, the other emphasizes the soccer player. The second one is active, not passive. That is, the subject is explicit. God is emphasized. His active, intentional doing the work of preparation is on display. And there's a third difference. Uh, the, verse 23 is a simple verb instead of, again, back to geeky grammar, an adjectival participial phrase. It's much more direct and much more attributed to God as the subject. Now listen, God prepares both. He is the potter working with the clay. But how God prepares them in both cases is different. And here's the difference. In verse 22, vessels destined for wrath, the emphasis is on the rebellious clay that will not obey the potter. How does God prepare them for destruction? By intentional Patient toleration. Intentional, patient toleration. And this includes what we looked at last week, judicial hardening. Someone wants what they want away from God. God may give you what you want, which is less of God. God may give you over in the futility of your thinking to further expressions of depravity. And then God may give you over in your depravity to yet further expressions of sinful rebellion. This is judicial. It's punishment for rejecting God. And the punishment is more rejection of God, which then is punishable. This is judicial hardening. And God intentionally tolerates this rebellion in increasing measure to accomplish his purpose of preparing them for destruction. God allows him to sin, judicially gives him over to his own desires and inclinations and will. In fact, God may prepare the man or provide the man everything he needs. Sunshine, rain, food, clothing, shelter. With the result that the man feels he is independent and doesn't need God. You see, God can harden a heart by giving good things. God may deprive him of what he needs, which ought to produce a sense of need and a crying out to God, but instead in the hard heart provokes ingratitude, bitterness, and rejection of God. God may grant what a man desires well above his needs, wealth, power, a great job, good health, and a family. And the bad clay goes on ungrateful, independent, and full of himself. God may withhold from a man the fulfillment of his desires, and the man makes an idol out of trying to fulfill them at any cost. You see, God prepares a vessel for destruction by patiently enduring her rebellion. In verse 23, vessels of mercy, the emphasis is on God, not the vessel. God is actively engaged in intentional active redemption rather than intentional patient toleration. Intentional active redemption for vessels of mercy. God takes the rebellious clay that has no ability, no inclination, no desire to obey the potter, and he transforms the clay. It's the good news. God prepares the vessel sheerly on account of his mercy by actively changing the material, granting by grace a willing heart, an inclination of Godward faith, and power to repent and believe and obey him. God softens a stony heart, breaks up rocky ground, gives life to the spiritually dead. And if he doesn't do these things for some, all the bits of clay would perish. And God may use gracious provision or life-altering trial to transform the clay. 
Again, there's no answer to this if. (laughs) What if God wants to do this to prepare vessels of wrath? What if God wants to do this to prepare vessels of mercy? This is in keeping with his character and purpose. Is God fair in his dealings? Is it right for God to punish sin even when those sins are employed by God to accomplish his purpose? Be careful with the question. That we not make God out to be a criminal when he is acting in perfect conformity to justice in keeping with his own character and purpose. The fault is not with God, my friends. The fault is with us. Consider this. To his own hurt and shame and humiliation and infinite suffering before men and before God, the Son of God came to earth and died on a cross to pay for the sins of whoever would believe. The protest question in verse 19 wants to challenge God's right to punish sins of people who never repent. But think about what God did for the sins of people who do repent. God exercised his right to punish those sins too. No sin goes unpunished. God's own righteousness, his justice demanded that those sins be punished. And so in order to forgive sins, while still upholding his justice, he punished those sins in a substitute. And no substitute was worthy or able to extinguish the wrath of God and bring forgiveness and adoption and reconciliation and new life except Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God and the Son of Man. He was the only one qualified to endure infinite wrath and survive it. He was the guiltless one in the place of the guilty. What kind of clay are you? who sit here this morning, breathing God's air. If you find yourself to be bad clay, seek God for change. He's the only one that can take bad clay and make it good. He's the only one that can transform you from the inside out. If you are bad clay and you want to stay bad clay, but you still want to rail against God for punishing your sins as if he's unjust in doing it. My friend, you will only end up a wasted life followed by eternal punishment. And no complaint about it can change the truth of it. Any more than you could swim into deep ocean, be surrounded by great white sharks, cut a big gash in your leg and say, they don't want to eat me, they're nice, they're nice. It's inevitable that you will be lunch. The the inexorable judgment of God is coming against sin. And no thinking it to be otherwise can change it. But changing your own thinking about Christ and turning to him in faith and turning away from your sin and surrendering your life to Jesus as Lord changes everything. Paul will be driving at that response of faith later on in Romans 9 and 10. Will you turn to God today and find yourself to be a vessel of mercy being prepared for glory? Let's pray. Oh God, we pray with Isaiah that you are our Father. We are the clay and you our potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. We beg you this day that our own pride would be humbled. That in our humility, we would be exalted to the glory of what it means to know you. To dwell with you in infinite increasing delight. Sins forgiven. Conscience cleansed. Loving you perfectly forever. May we know these things for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.